Welcome everyone. I hope you all are doing well. Thank you so much for stopping by my channel. Um, as you all know, if you're familiar with my channel, um, you know that my ministry focuses a lot on biblical scholarship and equipping believers with the knowledge and tools they need to understand the Bible better. And that is why I am very excited to introduce you to my guest today, uh, because he really shares this passion. Uh, he is part of Torah Resource, uh, which is an organization that is dedicated to providing biblically-based scholarly resources for Messianic communities. And um, I'll just have him uh, tell you all about that in a moment, but let's go ahead and bring him up here. Caleb, my friend, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, well, thank you so much for coming. It's an honor to have you on. Um, I have been a, a fan of Torah Resource for many years. Um, I have pretty much all of your dad's books. Um, I'm also one of the 36 listeners to uh, Messiah Matters, uh, the, the po podcast you do with Rob Van Hoff. And uh, yeah, the, the work that you guys do over at Torah Resource has had a huge impact on my own work. And so, um, yeah, it's just an honor to have you join me today, man. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so many of my viewers probably already know who you are. They certainly know your dad, Tim Hegg, um, because uh, I cite his work in, in my own work repeatedly. Uh, sure. But for those of um, who, who might not know you, uh, could you maybe introduce yourself and what you do? Yeah. Um, thank you. So uh, again, for having me on, it, it's really a, a pleasure to, uh, to join you today. Um, so yeah, my dad is... Uh, my dad, for lack of a better description, is probably one of the foremost leading uh, scholars in what we call one law theology. Um, that is the belief that uh, Jews and Gentiles alike uh, are covenant members and that the laws of Torah uh, apply both to Jew and Gentile today. And so um, that's mm -hmm. when I use the term one law, that's that's what I mean. And he started to come into um, the Messianic movement in the late 80s and really in the um, in the early 90s is when he started writing and uh, we started keeping the, the laws of God. Um, in the early 2000s, 2002, he started uh, tour a resource and it was really just an outlet for him to uh, share his work he was getting a lot of requests for his uh, articles and uh, he was writing books at that point and at this time he was he was actually uh, the theological editor for F first fruits of Zion and uh, so I came on board in 2006 and I was <laughs> I was just hired by my dad I was looking for a job I was just hired to um, put books together. He was spending so much time uh, binding his books and uh, sending out, uh, you know, articles and whatnot that uh, he asked me to come on and do that uh, part time for him. And so I did in 2006. Uh, his relationship with FFOZ unfortunately ended around 2008, 2009, and. Um, it, Tor Resource just started to grow and grow and grow. In 2011, he started an online school called Tor Resource Institute, um, and I started taking more responsibility uh, in 2011. But really, uh, in 2000, I don't know, 16, 17 is when I really started taking a, a larger role. Uh, my father has uh, recently, actually very recently in, in the past six months has, has uh, uh, moved into a partial retirement, which I think he, he desperately needs. He's uh, turning mm -hmm. 74 this year. And um, so he's focusing mainly on writing. And I have taken on more of a administrative role. And I think the Lord's kind of me, uh, leading me more into that. Um, but we have teachers, uh, more teachers that we're bringing on. And we have teachers that um, are teaching classes for Torah Resource Institute and writing papers. We have people writing books for us. So um, it is our goal to, it's really my, my goal to uh, educate the average believer. Mm. Um, and I don't think everyone needs a seminary education. But I definitely believe that parents should be able to teach their children. And I think that every believer should be passionate about the Bible and about knowing the truth. So that's really what our goal is at Torah Resource. Amen. Yeah. I, well, I, I definitely, uh, as I said earlier, have, have benefited greatly from the work that you guys do. And, and I'm, I'm the same as you. You know, I, I just have a passion for good scholarship and, and for getting good scholarship and theology in, into the hands of, of regular believers and, and instilling that that passion to learn, to, to dig deep into, into God's word and, and to just know him better. And so uh, I'm happy uh, to support your efforts over at Torah Resource. Um, 
you guys really do a, a great job over there. Um, I, I wanted to ask uh, you guys, uh, I, I do a, a little later today, I, I wanna ask you some questions about some of your recent work uh, personally, uh, because you've been digging into some really interesting topics that, that I think uh, viewers would be uh, happy to learn about. But uh, before we get there, uh, you guys recently launched Torah Resource Learning Center. And so this is a, a very recent development. Um, and, and so I'm kind of curious about that. Can you tell us about uh, what is Torah Resource Learning Center and what is the goal with that? Yeah, this is this is a uh, probably I'm probably going to talk on this more more than you m might want me to, um, but I'll I'll go back. Uh, you know, I said my dad started to come into the Messianic movement in in the early '90s and, and started mm -hmm. writing for the Messianic movement in the early '90s, and um, I honestly and truly believe that we are in a second Reformation. Now, there, uh, mm. obviously, there's a debate in in uh, church history whether or not there's been a second Reformation or not. Um, I believe that this is truly the second Reformation of the church and. And what I mean by that is the first Reformation in the 1500s um, was really centered on justification, okay? So, and knowledge, right? So there was there was a monopoly on knowledge of the Bible from the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church really held the keys to the Bible and whether or not people were able to read the Bible. People didn't walk around with a copy of the Bible. They, uh, they had to go to church to hear the Bible read. And so... Uh, you know, and it wasn't allowed in their language. It, it was in it was in Latin, and uh, and really, unless you were a monk, you didn't have the ability to read the Bible or even uh, translate the Bible or understand the Bible in your own language. And so there was this Reformation um, in the 1500s where um, there was this idea of, hey, we're justified by faith alone. And this was the first Reformation, and in, in, uh, you know, those who know church history know how much this has not only impacted the church, but impacted world history as we know it. And so, one of the things, and I'm getting to, I'm getting to the Learning Center, I promise. <laughs> um, one of the one of the things that uh, I have noticed about the Reformation is when the Reformation took took a, a shape and really started to grow, there were all these factions of people who had heretical doctrine, and these groups of people that started to um, move into to some heretical realms. And they did this because, once again, there was a lack of, of, of knowledge. There was a lack of biblical education and understanding. And throughout the years, it, it took some time, but ultimately the roots of, of good biblical theology and good biblical scholarship took root. And we started to gain traction, real traction in, in the Reformation. People started coming further mm. and further out of the Catholic Church. And this was due to the fact that people were able to actually study their Bibles and actually uh, dig into the Word of God. And so um, I believe that the Second Reformation has started, and I believe the Second Reformation is um, is now focused on sanctification. So the First Reformation was on justification and salvation by faith alone, becoming a covenant member. And now the Second Reformation is focused on being a covenant member. Now that we're covenant mm -hmm. members, now that we're part of the family of God, what do we do with that? Well, the Second Reformation, is, in my opinion, is this understanding that we keep the Torah, that the Torah is a birthright of ours. It is a it is a covenant uh, blessing of ours that we get to keep the Torah. And so uh, one of the ways that I think we can, I mean, we can even point to some, some evidence of this. You know, there are ministries today, um, you know, Andrew Schumacher in the beginning of Wisdom, his whole ministry is, is against the idea of keeping Torah. R.L. Solberg and his, uh, and his website on Torahism, he wrote a book uh, yeah. against the Torah yeah. movement. And why did he do this? Why why was it that they had to do this? You know, and if you look at ministries, um, John MacArthur, John Piper, um, the list just goes on of these famous, and uh, I'm not saying these men are not saved or that they're not godly in, in any way. That's not what I'm saying. In fact, I've gained so much from people like Sproul and Piper and MacArthur and, and all these guys, they've just been these giants of faith in the Christian realm. But the fact is, is that their ministries have had to deal with and respond to the idea of, of Christians keeping the Sabbath and Christians keeping the Torah. Why is that? And, and my answer to that is because it's becoming such a big issue. People yeah. in droves are coming to Torah and they're coming to believe that we should be keeping the Sabbath. And so... Um, but at the same time, just like the first Reformation, I believe that this Re Reformation started in the 80s, and uh, it's it's gaining and gaining and gaining. But what we saw in the in the early 90s was just kind of heresy everywhere, 
right? There was all sorts of teachers, famous teachers that were teaching things that were just not right. And uh, it kind of took shape even into the 2000s. And people are still trying to figure this out a little bit. You know, how, do, how does all this theology work together? And um, now there's this second generation, people like you and me and others who, and I could name, I could name a lot of people now who are saying, hey, education is really important. And, uh, you know, we have people who are going to seminaries. We have people who are getting their doctorates and defending PhD dissertations on Torah observance. This is, I mean, this should be a, everyone should be encouraged by this who keeps yeah. the Torah. Um, and so the the Reformation, just like the first Reformation, this Reformation is starting to get roots and is starting to uh, grow into good and, and healthy theology. And so one of the ways, uh, you know, like I was saying earlier, it's our goal at Torah Resource to try to educate the common believer who wants to keep Torah. And we kind of had uh, all these different avenues that people could do that. We had Torah Resource Institute, which was on one website. And then my father's body of work is just so large. And it's not just my father's. There's work that I've done. There's work that uh, Rob Van Hoff has done. Ariel Berkowitz has done and, and, and mm. others as well. We had just this giant catalog, and um, back in about 2017, 2018, I just said to the staff, hey, why don't we just make this available to everybody at a, at a single price? And so we made uh, the, the Tor Resource Library, the digital library, so all of our books and teachings and, and audio and video can all be purchased um, from, from Tor Resource in a hard copy, but you can also get it in digital format, but if you just want digital format stuff, you can get a library membership for as little as $15 a month, or you can get a discount if you pay for a year. And now you, you can get, uh, you know, you can get all of our digital products and you have access to it all at the, at your fingertips. And we're not just talking about, you know, a couple of teachings here or there. Um, my father's five volume, uh, work on Matthew is accompanied by 218 hour long lectures. Um, his mm. work on Galatians is a full commentary with 58 lectures on Galatians. I mean, the list just goes on and on. He, I mean, the, the, the catalog is, is enormous. It is, it is, it would take you a very long time to get through it. So all of this to say, uh, what we did about three or four months ago was we took all of these different avenues. So you can take classes or you can get into the library or everything. And we put it all into one place. And this is the TR learning center. And it is our goal. And be, I, I should slow down a little bit beyond just learning, being able to learn. It's also a place for people to connect. Um, there are discussion tabs on every single one of the teachings, both in the library and in the classes. So people can discuss uh, together on various topics. They can they can have discussions and and uh, civil debates uh, on, on certain <laughs> topics um, and uh, kind of get to know each other and try to build out this community of believers. And we're not always going to agree, obviously, but it's our goal to try to center around the word of God and good scholarship and um, be able to build a community, but also be able to educate the average believer uh, in this one place where people just have access to so much stuff. So that's what the TR Learning Center is. Amen. Well, uh, my friends, uh, definitely check it out. What's, what's the website, Caleb? trlearningcenter.com. You can also find it just by going to Torah Resource. It's going to be on the homepage. You'll be able to find all, all the links are right there. Okay, great. I, I will put those links in the description of this video as well. Uh, my friends, check it out. Um, it is worth it. Uh, I'm a member um, and it is solid scholarship. Uh, and and it, I mean, you're getting so much for for a really good price. Um, and, it, and we, we, yeah. and, and just, just to, on the heels of that, we, we try to um, add stuff. We try to add at least one to two things every single month. So the, the, the learning center is constantly growing. Um, it's mm. not, it's not just what you see. It's, you know, we're constantly building it. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And, and so, um, yeah, I, I would encourage you guys if, if that's something that's, it, uh, interests you if you're interested in good scholarly commentaries on, on the new Testament from a pro Torah perspective, um, I, I highly recommend it. Honestly, can't recommend it enough. So, um, yeah, I, I would uh, encourage you guys to check that out. And, uh, yeah, thank you, Caleb, for, um, for kind of, uh, giving the vision for that and, and explaining, uh, yeah, that, that, that's such a good insight about, you know, this, you know, th this notion that we're sort of in a, another reformation that, that we're continuing or, or extending the reformation, right. You know, we're, right. yeah. we're go getting back to the scriptures. We're getting back to 
what did uh, the Messiah and the apostles, how did they actually live? What did they actually teach? And, and, uh, and you know, what, looking at the scriptures with fresh eyes, instead of filtering it through, you know, later church tradition, um, but, but really getting back to the source and, uh, and, and God's, I mean, that's, that's a foundation of the Reformation, right? You know, sola scriptura, um, uh, the scriptures are the final authority. And so, yeah, I'm really excited about what you guys are doing. And uh, speaking of all the work that your dad has done, um, he has written, I, I think, like a thousand and twenty-five books uh, at this point. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a lot. It is a yeah, lot. Yeah, he's yeah. he's written a lot. But uh, I, I want to ask: uh, Does he have any new content coming out? Any new commentaries or anything like that? Yeah, it's a good question. We, uh, my dad took a, a little bit of a, a break, and uh, he's currently finishing up a, a commentary on First and Second Thessalonians. That's what mm -hmm. he's working on right now. Um, we're also putting together a book. There's uh, a number of articles that he did back in the early, actually from like 2006 through 2014. We're compiling these uh, articles, and it's uh, for lack of a better description, it's a defense of one law theology and or pronomian mm. theology, however you want to say that. And um, and uh, I think the interesting thing ab uh, about these articles is that they have been available in, in various places. However, I think that because of the names of the articles, people haven't realized the content of them. And yeah. uh, I'm actually the one who's been able to compile and, and edit these uh, these these articles together to create a book. Uh, and uh, as I've been going through it, I've just thought, man, this is so good. And I don't think people have understood that they're, that it's just sitting there. And so yeah. um, we're going to put it in book form and we're going to make it into a book that's going to come out. And then um, uh, down the road, even further down the road, uh, we're going to do an excursus book. My father has, if you read my dad's uh, commentaries, he always goes into excursus on various topics. So he'll have an excursus maybe on the Holy Spirit or he'll have an right. excursus on circumcision in the right. first century. And uh, we're going to start making volumes of just the excursus portions of uh, the books and compiling those together oh, cool. so people have topics as well that they can, that they can pull out. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And I know you guys are uh, working on a Festrift too, in, in honor of your dad. Uh, or is that, am I allowed to talk about that? No, that's fine. Yeah, actually we are. Uh, so we're putting together a Festrift for my father. Uh, and that is, I think the, um, I think the, the uh, release date for that is hopefully sometime in, um, it'll be in 2025. Uh, I think mm -hmm. all articles have to be in by February of 2025, which means we'll probably release sometime around June. I, he's not aware of that, but, uh, yeah. but no, it's, it's not a problem. It's, uh, uh, he's not aware of it yet, but, uh, I think that we'll probably let him in on the secret sometime soon, but there, the, the response to, um, us writing a fast rift has been overwhelming. There's been a significant amount of people who have not only been asked, you know, we've, we went and asked some of his former students. My father's been a, a teacher at, at numerous seminaries and, um, mm. you know, obviously at his own school tour resource Institute. And, um, so we've asked some of his students to write. We've asked scholars that, uh, some, some well-known scholars to write, and they were very happy to do so. Um, so yeah. yeah. And so we've even had people come and ask us, would I, would I be able to write for you in the fast shrift? And, um, so, uh, we're, we're very excited about it. And, uh, there's actually a number, I mean, the fast shrift is, is one thing that we're doing as well. There's other things that people aren't aware of that we're doing. We're putting together a, a conference. Um, and uh, I think I'm allowed to talk about this at this point. We're putting together a conference. It'll be the first annual conference that we're doing for pronomian theology. Um, and it's really to advance and push scholarship in the pronomian realm and, um, to challenge each other, but also to let people know that this is, you know, there is a scholarly uh, aspect of of this theology, and we're going to show that. We've been talking about putting together a um, a uh, theological journal each year, and possibly twice a year as well. So there, we have a lot going on, and uh, our first um, the first annual conference uh, Pronomian conference will be uh, online. It'll mm -hmm. be on December 15th, and uh, we will be releasing uh, more details and the ability to sign up for that conference, um, uh, to attend the conference, uh, should should be within the next probably two to three weeks. Awesome. Yeah, well, I, I will definitely uh, 
be be excited to learn more about that when the when the information is available. And uh, yeah, um, yeah, you guys are doing a lot. That's that's exciting. We got a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I ju I just uh, I I'm just so excited about it because um, you know, a, as you know, and and as you agree, there there is just such a need for good scholarly right. resources uh, in, in this movement uh, of of Christians that are that are coming and and learning about the Torah. There there's just a there's just a, a great need for that, and and to see Absolutely. that, yeah, to see see that need being met, you know, the, the effort uh, of meeting that need is just really exciting. So, um, yeah, well, we can kind of uh, switch gears here. Um, sure. Like like I said, everyone, uh, check out TR Learning Center uh, and and Torah Resource uh, for you know to, to learn more. Um, but yeah, uh, Caleb, I, I wanted to ask you about your work because uh, you're doing some some really interesting studies right now um, that uh, I, I think has, uh, as you put it, you know, you said that it's kind of had a major impact on the way that you right. read certain passages. Um, but you have been studying a couple different topics, and I thought I would ask you about both of them. Um, you sure. have been You've been doing some work on meals in the Greco-Roman era and right just just learning about customs meal customs um and apparently this has a really big impact on on how we should understand the new testament when, when it comes to um certain passages dealing with eating and and meals and all of that can you maybe expound on that a little bit yeah so um the this whole thing started uh year 2018 i believe is when uh when it started i was looking for maybe even earlier than that i was looking for a a topic to write uh, a thesis on and uh somebody happened to say i was i was at the evangelical theological society and somebody was giving a paper and they said this is going to sound weird, but they said uh, Christ never required sacrifice to himself and so this was an argument against Christ being uh, Yod -Heh -Vav -Heh, about uh, against his hmm. deity and my first I don't know why but it just popped into my head yes he did he said do this in remembrance of me and hmm. so I'll explain this for a second but this is the road that that uh, led me down I didn't even know that there was an entire section of the Society of Biblical Literature dedicated to, to meals in the Greco-Roman world I mean talk about talk about biblical nerdism um it, it really like you really have to be in a special place to, to decide that you're uh, going to focus on meals in the in the greco-roman era um but as i've uh, as i've learned more and more about uh meals i've realized the impact of eating and the and the importance of eating in the bible almost every time in the tanakh that you see a major event happen there is a meal that that goes along with it and i just give you just a couple of examples the fall of man is is centered around eating um we were man was commanded that he could eat anything in the garden that he wanted except for he couldn't eat so a prohibition against eating he couldn't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil um mm -hmm. one of my favorite ones is when the 70 elders of israel um they go up and they see the god of israel and beneath his feet is like glass or sapphire however you want to translate that and the very next verse what do they do and they sat down and ate together and uh -huh. so there's um and and i could i mean i could just keep going and going and going um you know hannah and uh, uh the birth of samuel she eats a meal anytime there's a covenant uh cut there there is a meal that is uh that is it goes along with it um meals seem to be a central portion of of life within the bible and it's not just that we have to eat to stay alive um it's actually that there is significance there when uh when we eat together this comes uh, full circle into the apostolic scriptures or the New Testament, however you want to say that. Um, there's a, a social prohibition. This is not within Torah, of course, and, and I, clearly the Bible is against this, but there's this social prohibition against Jews eating with Gentiles, and we could talk a lot about this and and the um, the the reasons that this was. And actually, I think that this actually plays more into um, some of the biblical texts that we could look at. And uh, so the idea that um, well, I'll just kind of move a little bit here. 
Um, one of the things that really struck me is that in the in the Greco-Roman world, now this isn't necessarily for the Jew, the Jews within the Greco-Roman world. However, in the Greco-Roman world, if you were going to have meat, it came from a banquet. It came from a Dapnon or a symposium. And these uh, formal bank banquets were always associated with some kind of offering to the gods mm -hmm. um now we see this we see the same thing within within judaism right um there is meat on the table and it's usually sacrificed or there's meat on the table and they are offering it to god in some way shape or form and and um so uh, all of this to say in the greco-roman world if there was meat on the table uh, it came from one of two places. Either you were in a symposium, you were in a in, in a formal banquet, and this has been slaughtered and um, sacrificed uh, to the gods by the person who is whose job it is to do exactly that. Mm -hmm. Once that meat was sacrificed um, and uh, the meat was divvied up, however it was supposed to be, anything that was left over would be taken to the meat market. In fact, you were not allowed to take any meat to the meat market that had not already been offered to the gods. Now, the I think that really? your listeners are going to, yeah, you're not, and uh, I have receipts on this, by the way. <laughs> I'm not just making this up. Um, there's been a lot of work done on this, um, but uh, particularly at like when we think of the Corinth meat market, which has been found archaeologically, by the way. Um, it, when you think of this, they you weren't allowed to bring meat into the meat market that wasn't already offered to the gods. Now, what is the impl implications for this for believers in Corinth who want to go and buy meat? And so Paul, I think, talks specifically to this in Romans 14 and the idea of, you know, one person abstains and only eats vegetables while one person says it's okay to eat whatever he wants. In um, 1 Corinthians 10, he talks specifically about abstaining and uh, how you cannot, it, basically, if, if meat is offered to an idol, who cares? That's an, it, It's a demon. It doesn't really matter. There's nothing in that, right? We serve the one true God. But he also juxtaposes that with you cannot um, eat at the table table of, of demons and eat at the table of the Lord. Now, the Christian church has notoriously taken this, and I'm, I'm, I'm fitting probably hours and hours of what could be lectures into a five-minute uh, rundown, but um, the church has taken the table of the Lord to be the Eucharist or to be the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that this actually, the more I study this and the more I talk to people about this, I think that this is actually, so we have Let's slow down here just a little bit. We have what I consider to be foundational issues. So um, the canon, the 66 book canon, or salvation by faith alone, or the deity of, of Yeshua, or these things are foundational issues to our, our theology, right? But then you have what we call like peripheral theological views. And to me, this would be one of them. And um, But the church doesn't think so. So uh, the the Eucharist or the or the communion has been one of the big issues within Christianity and not just this is not just a difference between Torah observant uh, believers and and Christianity right so within Christianity even the heretical groups that everybody says aren't even Christian like the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witness right um they still take the Eucharist like they still take communion Everybody takes community. It's a staple. It is a staple of Christianity. And so when we as Torah observant believers come along and say, I don't know if he's actually telling us to do this, you know, I think it's something else. Maybe it's the Passover. This is a this is a uh, attack on a central doctrine of Christianity. Mm -hmm. There have been people who have, I mean, the church is split over this, right? I mean, transubstantiation, the idea that Christ, that the, the elements of the of the Eucharist become the body and blood of Christ has been a major point of contention within within Christianity. And so all of a sudden, when you have Torah observant believers like myself who come and say, "Look, I don't," you know, Yeshua is clearly talking about the Passover when he when he uh, says, "Do this in remembrance of me." In Luke twenty two, these are fighting words. I mean, yeah. it's it's really fighting words for the Christian church. Now, one of the peripheral items that we see within the Torah movement, and this has been very interesting for me, has been the chronology of the Passion. Um, right. And so we could we could talk all about this if we wanted to. I've done videos. I've written on this extensively. My father's written on this extensively. I think that there's an easy way to explain uh, the, the chronologies. I'm not going to get into it right now, but... Ultimately, the work that I've done in the past two months, and, and maybe this will kind of drive to the point of what you were trying to get to, and then we can we can ask specific questions or talk about specific passages. 
The work that I've tried to do specifically in the past couple of months has been this. When Yeshua says, do this in remembrance of me in, in Luke 22, 19, what is he actually saying? Now, we can take two avenues here. We can take the avenue that people believe that Yeshua was celebrating a Passover meal on the night of Nisan 14. Once again, I'm not going to get into chronology, chronology issues, but essentially you have two views. You have a view that Yeshua di died on Nisan 15, which is the festival Sabbath of the Passover. And then you have the view that, no, that's not right. He actually died on Nisan 14 because people want him to die at the same time as the, the slaughtering of the Passover lambs. I don't think that's necessary. Yeshua is our Yom Kippur sacrifice. He was not, uh, he didn't, he wasn't crucified anywhere near um, Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. Neither here nor there. It really doesn't matter what, what um, chronology you want to take. And, and, so, and what I mean by that is this is the work I've been trying to do is to show people that it doesn't matter what chronology you take or whether or not you believe Yeshua was celebrating a Passover meal or not. And, and I'll, I'll tell you why. So if Yeshua was celebrating a Passover meal, okay, he says in the synoptic gospels, go and prepare the Pascha for me. This word Pascha, I, I've argued there's five different uh, meanings of the word Pascha, but no matter what he's saying in this passage, go and get the sacrifice ready and then bring it to us. Okay. Mm -hmm. If Yeshua is celebrating a Passover uh, meal on the night of Nisan 14, then there is a Passover lamb that has been sacrificed in the temple and it is sitting on the table in front of him. If Yeshua says, do this, that is the Passover, and there's a sacrifice there in remembrance of me, by the way, these two terms, to do the Passover, is found twice in Exodus 12. You are to do the Passover and right. the uh, sojourner is to do the Passover with you if they are circumcised, right? So we are to do the Passover. So he's hearkening back to these same words, to do the Passover, as a uh, Exodus 12 says, as a continual memorial unto yod heh vav -Hey. We're supposed to do this as a continual memorial to yod heh vav -Hey, but Yeshua now takes this and says, do this as a memorial to me. So he's wow. taking it from yod heh vav -Hey and pointing it to him. And yeah. so just, just those words there would be a declaration of deity. But if there's a sacrifice on the table, then there's a sacrifice included. We're not allowed to sacrifice to anyone except for yod heh vav -Hey. And so I, my argument is, is that if it's a Passover meal, then clearly Yeshua is telling people to do something that can only be done to yod heh vav -Hey, And thus, this is a declaration of deity. Okay, but what if it's not a Passover meal? What if it's actually Nisan 13 and uh, it's some kind of a love feast? There have been plenty of people in the Torah movement that have argued this. Um, in fact, within the Christian world, there are plenty of people who argued this. Um, Craig Keener, who I think you've referenced numerous times, Craig Keener uh, has taken the Johannine uh, chronology. And uh, that means that he believed that Yeshua actually died on Nisan 14 and not on Nisan 15. Now, Keener has actually changed his view on this. Uh, mm -hmm. Many people don't know this, but because of the work that Brant Petrie has done, um, Keener has actually started to shift his view to what is called the Passover hypothesis. I won't get into that, but um, I talked personally with Keener on this issue. Not the point. So um, I just say all this to say that there are plenty of good people and good believers and good scholars who have taken the view that Yeshua was uh, celebrating a love feast on the 13th of Nisan. This wasn't a Passover meal and mm. that he died on Nisan 14. So if this is the case, then what do we do with that? Well, here's the thing. If we look at the Last Supper just in general, what we can see is that there are plenty of and this is where I get, okay, I got to slow down here. I get into a lot of trouble here and I've, I've actually come under fire quite a bit. Um, and not just me, actually, anyone who studies uh, meals in the Greco-Roman world, what they realize is that the Last Supper is not following a Passover Seder. And this has been, mm -hmm. when I tell this to Messianic Jews, even my father has been offended by this in, in uh, you know, minorly in, in this. When I tell people like, hey, your four cups that that are traditional in the Passover Seder, these didn't come around until like the 700 years after Christ, people get very offended by that. Now, I'm not saying to people, you shouldn't do these traditions. They might be great traditions. And there are great traditions that have been made after crisis on earth. I'm not telling people not to do things. I'm just saying that there is a timeline that goes along here. So we can look at Greco-Roman customs 
and realized that the Jews were doing these same exact customs. And I'll give you a couple of them. So for instance, uh, when a when people came to a, a Daipnon or a symposium, that is like a formal banquet, they mm -hmm. would come and they would uh, enter the door and then the servants would take their shoes off and they would wash their feet. So we see this in the Gospels, right? Yeshua takes the role of the servant and he washes the feet of the disciples. This was standard practice within Greco-Roman meals. Another one is, is that uh, people would recline at table. Now, later Judaism has taken this and said, oh, we recline because we once were slaves, but now we're not. Right. Well, there's something called triclinia, which were actual... Um, uh, rooms where couches were made, uh, where people would recline at table. And this is the standard practice in, in, uh, in Greco-Roman meals. And we see this within the gospels, even when they're out in the, you know, out wandering with, uh, you know, with masses of people, they all, uh, recline to eat. Right. So we see this throughout the gospels. Um, uh, another one is, is that, uh, within the, the symposiums, they would have, they would have bowls and people would share their, their, their bowls of, of food. And so uh, we see this, right? Yeshua says, the, the hand that dips with me is the one who will betray me. And so mm -hmm. um, this is not anything special for a Passover meal. It's actually something that was standard practice within the Greco-Roman world. And I could go on and on and on. We even see within uh, the Gospels, uh, Yeshua talks about status, uh, within these meals, something that uh, that was standard within the Greco-Roman world, where you sat, said how high in in society you actually were, how how great your status was in society. Yeah. Yeshua says uh, in Luke, he he says, if you go to a wedding banquet, don't sit in the high, you know, in a seat of honor. The host might come and tell you to sit down there, and then you're going to be dishonored by that. Instead, sit in the lowest place, and then the host may come and tell you to sit somewhere else. So we see all of these customs that are just standard with uh, Greco-Roman meal customs that have been adopted by Jews, and there's nothing wrong with that. We do that in our own day and age too, right? I mean, if you go mm -hmm. to a wedding, you're probably going to see that the father of the bride is going to dance with the bride, or that you know the, the, the bride is going to throw her bouquet, or you know, it doesn't matter if it's an Indian wedding, or a Jewish wedding, or an American wedding or whatever, if you do it in America, it's probably going to follow some of these standard practices and there's nothing pagan about it and there's nothing. So anyway, <laughs> one of the things that was done in the, uh, in the Dapnons was that a cup of wine was dedicated to a God. And we even do this in some form today. We pray before we eat, right? We pray to our God and we thank him for the food that he has given to us and we bless the food in his name, right? Okay, so this is this is standard practice today. In, in the first century, you would dedicate a cup of wine at the beginning of, the, of a meal and you dedicate the wine at the end of the meal as you went into more of the ceremonial aspects of it. Well, we see this in Luke. Yeshua dedicates a, a cup of wine, and then after the meal, likewise, he uh, takes uh, the cup and he blesses it, and then he passes it around. But he says to do it unto him at this point. And so um, the other thing that we can ask is, so all of, all of this to say is that there are religious and worship aspects within the meal, whether or not it's a, whether or not it's a, uh, a Passover meal or not, there is an element of they are worshiping God and Yeshua says to do it unto him. If there's meat on the table, then it's a sacrifice anyway, uh, in some way, shape or form, um, it's dedicated to God. Yeshua says to do it unto him. The only way that this could happen with all of these customs wrapped around it if, is if Yeshua is saying to do things that are unto God, unto uh -huh. him. Once again, if it's not a Passover meal, it doesn't matter. It's still a declaration of deity. That's my thesis. That That is, yeah, that's fascinating. Um, you know, we, we're just so far removed from so many of these, uh, standard customs that, that were around. Right. Um, but an, an original, someone from that culture, what, you know, Luke's original readers, right. They, that probably would have jumped out at them. Uh, when they, that and yeah. and Paul in in First Corinthians, he continues to reference meal customs for the Greco-Roman mm -hmm. world. That people in Corinth would say they know exactly what he's talking about. He's referencing cups. He's referencing tables of of demons and table of the Lord. They know exactly what he's talking about. We don't, and so people just they try to to push later tradition, you know, the Lord's Supper, the elements of bread and wine didn't become uh -huh. the elements of the Eucharist until the fourth century. And so the idea that he's saying, take the cup, you know, the cup represented 
it didn't just represent wine. It represented the ceremonial aspects of a meal. Bread didn't just represent bread. We see this throughout the Torah itself and throughout the Tanakh. Bread represents food in general. So mm -hmm. there were full meals that were celebrated as love feasts and as um, you know communion uh, all the way up until the fourth century when they solidified the bread and wine as the elements of, of the communion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you kind of made, made the analogy earlier about, uh, you know, praying before meals, like what you're describing here would kind of be like the equivalent of the family sitting down at Thanksgiving dinner to say grace. Right. And the That's head of the table, the head of the table be like, all right, who wants to pray to me? <laughs> you know, like who wants to. Exactly. To yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, that that's a uh... That, that's really fascinating, man. Um, I, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you this too. You know, one of the things that, that my studies have done is they've really made me think about food in general and, and my intake of food. Now, obviously I keep a kosher diet because I, I, I'm Torah observant. And when I say, when I say kosher, I, I don't mean rabbinically kosher. I'm not looking for kosher stamps necessarily, but I am very cognizant of what goes into my body um, mm -hmm. because of the kosher laws. But also, I'm also starting to realize like, hey, if I'm eating meat, uh, there's been a life that has been given. There's a lot wrapped up in that um, mm -hmm. in terms of the, uh, the fall and death and all these kind of things. Um, beyond that, uh, one of the things that I've started doing is, is baking sourdough because I wanted to understand what it was like for uh, Israel to come out of Egypt and not have a starter or to have to make a starter. And then what's it like every year if you throw away your starter and then like, what do you do? When do you start making another starter? You know, do, uh, how long are you going to go without bread? You know, are you going to be eating uh, unleavened bread for 14 days because you can't make a starter for the first seven? So, I mean, there's all these things that are wrapped up in it. And it's really been a, it's been a fun journey, but it's also been a delicious journey. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Matzah pizza is pretty good. If you, if you exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's fascinating. Um, yeah, well, well, thanks for sharing uh, all of that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely, it's it's um, prompted me, I've been taking a couple notes here, prompted me to look into a couple of things. I, I wanted to ask you about um, some of the things, because you mentioned this notion that the Lord's Supper, um, obviously the very foundational uh, ordinance in, in uh, Christianity today, how, um, what we know today is the Lord's Supper is later tradition. Um, uh, so we look at some passages. Uh, the basis for this ordinance uh, are obviously the, the same passages that you've been talking about, 1 Corinthians 11 um, and Luke 22. Right. What, what do you think is actually going on there in, in those passages? So like when, when Paul talks about this, this ritual meal that they're doing in, in first Corinthians 11, um, mm -hmm. it, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. So this has been a, what I would consider to be an elusive passage for me for, for quite some mm -hmm. time. And I think that I'm finally starting to come to some realizations here. Uh, first we have to understand first and foremost, that the the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, the elements were not set in the first century. So when Paul talks about a cup or when he talks about bread, he's not referencing elements that they would have known as communion. Like, uh -huh. So, and I think that that's one of the things that we kind of have to, we really have to solidify in our own minds as we re read through these things. Central to a Passover meal is the lamb, right? That is the Passover meal. Um, and we have problems today, even trying to, to keep keep the Passover, right? Every mm -hmm. single year we get asked the question, well, I'm not circumcised. Can I still eat the Passover? And it's like, well, there's no lamb on the table that's been sacrificed right. in the temple. That's what you have to be circumcised to eat. So right. um, one of the things that I've thought of is Paul is talking to a Corinthian community. They are over 400 miles away from Jerusalem. They're not going to get a lamb sacrificed in Jerusalem. They couldn't anyway, right? They're Gentiles, for the, predominantly Gentiles. So the idea that you'd have a bunch of Gentiles go to the temple and sacrifice a Passover lamb, even if they're circumcised, is, is not going to fly. It's just not, that's not how it worked. And so right. I think Paul- Yeah, they're, they're 800 miles away. Yeah, they're- Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think Paul is looking at this. He's, you know, I, I 
often call uh, 1 Corinthians Paul's Passover letter, right? He talks about mm-hmm. Passover throughout the entire the entire letter. Uh, you know, in, in uh, chapter 5, he says, therefore, celebrate the feast. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, I mean, and he's talking about Passover there, obviously. Um, so I, I think that in his mind, at the forefront of his mind, and I think that when he's writing this letter, Passover is coming up. Okay, so and uh, after this letter is written, he then goes and he tries to get back to Jerusalem for Pentecost. Right, so Passover somewhere, uh, you know, it's on his mind. It's it's in that season he's writing this, but I think he also realizes the Corinthians don't have a lamb on their table. So what are they really doing? Right? Mm-hmm. Um, are they celebrating Passover? Well, in some ways, I think Paul would say, yeah, they, they are. Therefore, celebrate the feast, not with with malice or hate. Right? right. Um, so he he he's realizing that there is this celebration, but at the same time, he's also realizing this isn't really a Passover meal. Um, and so th- the the view that I've taken currently, and um, I am open to suggestions and to change on this um, because I'm still very much working with with the there's no one who's written from a perspective of a pro tour perspective. Every, mm-hmm. every Christian scholar that I've read says, Oh, he's talking about the communion. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm, I'm not convinced of that. In fact, I'm not even necessarily convinced that he's still talking about Passover. Uh, I think that what he's doing is he's taking the last supper as the model banquet. Yeshua, mm-hmm. it's it's the model banquet that Yeshua has. It's the one that the disciples talk about the most. Everybody knows about it. Every, you know, he's been handed down this tradition of, you know, do this in remembrance of me. He talks about it on the night that Yeshua was crucified. He says, you know, so on and so forth. So he's taking this as the model banquet. And then he's saying, look, you guys are coming together. You're not eating together. Some of you eat, some of you go hungry. Some of, you know, so he's talking about the church getting together in general, I believe. And I know that there's going to be a a big push against that by some in the Torah movement. But what I see him talking about here, he's, he's been talking in the previous chapter about partaking in the table of the Lord and the table of demons. I see this as anytime you are doing a meal with other believers and you are worshiping the Lord in, eating, which I think is something that we don't think about a lot today, but it, I think it was very much on the minds of people in the first century. And I think it should be on our minds more often, right? We should eat mm-hmm. together and we should see it as a form of worship. And so in in 10, he's talking about this idea of, of worshiping God together as believers and that we come together and we're at the table of the Lord. And then in 11, I think he's still talking about that. And he uses the, the, the Last Supper as the model, right? And mm-hmm. The bread and the wine are representations of any kind of ceremonial meal and any kind of food that would be eaten in that meal. So when he says you, you know, you eat, well, let's see here. What exactly does he say? Um, there's been factions, right? He's talking about factions and how there's been this, this split between people. When people come together, it's not uh, the Lord's Supper that they eat. What does that mean? Well, he's once again, he's not talking about communion here. Mm -hmm. Uh, We know that he's not talking about communion. So when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. In other words, it's not worship of of Yeshua that you're doing. For in eating, each one goes ahead in his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. So Mm -hmm. what are you really doing? This clearly can't be worship of God, right? Right. What do you not have uh, houses to eat and drink in? So there's he's trying to establish that there's more in these meals, in these these worship, uh, in these forms of worship than just eating and drinking like the standard um, uh, culture around them. The Greco-Roman culture around them is going to say, hey, let's get together and have a drinking party. And he's saying, no, 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 there is a lot more to, to, to that than, than uh, to this than what you think. And then he goes on and he says, for I received from the Lord uh, what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Yeshua on the night that he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So he's putting forward this idea of uh, what does it look like to worship God in a meal in the same way? I'll, uh, yeah. I'll go ahead. Interesting. Uh, so, so what you're, and, and let, let me know if I'm uh, getting this, if I'm characterizing this correctly, what you're saying is in the Greco-Roman world, meals were religious by definition. Yes. Yes. And so what Paul may be doing here in first Corinthians 11 is that uh, he is trying to differentiate how the community is to approach uh, communal meals he, yes. from from the wider Greco-Roman culture. He's saying like, listen, this is what the, the culture does. 
they they for their religious meals they get together uh, their communal meals they get together they they have drinking parties and orgies and all and all this stuff um, and they yep. get drunk you're not to be like that like you're yes. you're you, you, when you're getting together and you're doing these things you're you're not honoring the Messiah and and so right so he is so it, he's using he's using the the uh, the the framework of of the Messiah's Last Supper as, as sort of to instill the the spirit of what a Christian communal meal should look like it should be right and it should be to honor the Messiah right in twenty five he said he references do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Um, and so our meal should be, if, if we're in a communal meal with other believers, our meal should be done under, under Yeshua. And then, and 26 is, is really the reason that I've come to this belief, at least, you know, and once again, I'm still, I'm still forming this belief, but mm -hmm. one of the reasons that I've come to this belief is be, is because of 26. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, right? Some people have said, well, he means once a year. Right. Mm -hmm. he, he, he just means as often as you do it, that is once a year. But he could just say when you eat the Passover or something like that, he doesn't. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so to me, it seems to me and, you know, once again, I think more research on my part needs to be done. But it seems to me like he's referencing um, more just uh, more often of a meal. And and the next verse, 27 Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. Once again, the church is going to say, see, this is communion. But if right. we realize that bread and wine were not solidified as the elements until the fourth century, um, and there's been really good scholarship that has been done by uh, by actually an Anglican priest named uh, Andrew McGowan, who's kind of at the forefront of meals in the Greco-Roman world. He's the one who's shown that that these elements didn't solidify until the fourth century. Um, but so wh whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup, of the Lord in an unworthy manner is guilty. Okay, so once again, I think that we're talking about this idea of we're a, a community of believers. One of the highest forms of worship is when we can get together and we can eat together. And Yeshua even says that the highest banquet that we have each year, which is the Passover, is to be done in remembrance of him. How much more then should each meal that we get together and eat in worship to, to the Lord be done in remembrance of him, right? So this is kind of what I've been playing with in the first Corinthians. I, I, I fully admit that this is a difficult passage and that yeah. it's one that I'm still uh, working with and struggling with and that people are pushing against me on it, which is totally fine. I'm happy with that, but I, I'm not sure that we can, uh, that we can see it another way. Maybe we could see it. And I've, I've lived in this realm a little bit. Maybe we could see it as a Passover meal once a year. So he's talking about, about a Passover meal once a year, but I think as often take, as you celebrate the Passover, right? Right, right. But I think that um, if we take it on the heels of the end of chapter 10, which he's clearly talking about meals in general, he's not talking about Passover here. He's right. clearly talking about meals in general. If that's the case, you know, if we take them together, then there, there's more that's going on here than just the Passover. And so that's kind of where I've been working with that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fascinating, man. Um, I, I'm intrigued by your perspective. I, I think uh, I think it's interesting. I really like the implications of it because because you're you're coming at this uh, passage and you're recognizing um, and again you're you're trying to look at the passage with fresh eyes without the without the filter of tradition, whether that be later uh, Christian tradition or even messianic tradition. Because uh, right. as, as messianics, we we kind of have a theological incentive to to see this as as the Passover. But yeah, but yeah, we want to we want to look at the passage with fresh eyes, and we recognize culturally that right. meals meals by their very nature, communal meals by their very nature, were religious. They were religious right. um, gatherings, and and so that if if your perspective is true, I mean that really ought to revolutionize the way that we think about um, uh, gatherings, w w you know, to eat eat meals together a as believers. That really that really ought to um, impact how we approach communal um, potlucks, right? <laughs> and when we get together so and, and and eat meals. 
So several things on this, you know, one of the things that I, that I've noticed if and I travel uh, somewhat, not a lot, but I travel with my family and, and go to various congregations. I've traveled a lot in the past with my dad to uh, have him present at, at congregations and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I, I will say this within the messianic pronomian Torah movement, whatever you want to say, there is a overwhelming amount of congregations. They get together, they have their service, and then they'll, they'll call it oneg, or they'll they'll say, hey, we eat afterwards, or whatever. There's usually a meal that is attached within the Messianic realm or within the Torah movement realm um, mm -hmm. attached to the worship service. And, and, and I think that this is great. It's almost never the case in Christian churches when we go to Christian churches. So there already is an element of this going on. Now, whether or not, uh, and once again, I, I'm willing to, to say that I, I know it's a controversial view, and I also know that I'm probably not going to sway a lot of people in this view um, right away, and that's totally fine. Um, but I will say this, even if 1 Corinthians uh, 11 is talking about the Passover, and it's just talking about the Passover, there are plenty of other places that we can go all throughout the Tanakh and the Apostolic Scriptures to show that that meals, especially with believers, like together with believers, should be seen as a form of worship. Now, this goes back to you know what I was talking about in terms of uh, Jews weren't allowed to eat with Gentiles. One of the reasons why is because if you are a Gentile and you're not considered a covenant member, then any meal that you have, you're not worship like you're not truly worshiping the God that we worship, kind of a thing. We see this in, in Galatians too, right? Peter mm. uh, is eating with the Gentiles, and then the Jews come and he separates from them right away. Well, this is because within their culture, if you're eating with Gentiles, you're going to be accused of idolatry. And I think that Paul is saying, look, man, no, that's not how it works. These people are covenant members. And so we have to see them as covenant members. All of this to say, I think that as believers, we should really understand um, our eating together as a form of worship. Now, the implications for this are can also um, be not so great. You know, my family... Uh, and this is a very long story. I won't, I will not get into it, but um, my family goes to a, a non-denominational Christian church on Sundays. And uh, we've been to potlucks at the church where there is pork on the table. Hmm. And so what are the implications if we are worshiping yod -Heh vav -Heh as a group of believers and there's pork on the table, which is an abomination to our God? Hmm. What are, you know, how do we deal with that? And how do we, you know, how do we navigate these kind of things? Do we just not eat, you know, eat that or do we just not eat or do, you know, I mean, and I don't have answers for this. I, I honestly don't. I think it's uh, it's a case by case basis. And I think each person has to has to figure it out for themselves. But um, yeah, there's a lot of Im implications when we start to see um, food as a form of worship and also the implications of us not eating fasting. And right. the implications of that and, and how we give up food for, for God as well. Yeah, it, it's it's fascinating. Um, it, it really puts things into context. Uh, just the story you, you just told about going to the potluck. Um, it helps you kind of sympathize a little bit, uh, even though they were wrong. But but it helps you sympathize the the opponents of the with, with the opponents of the apostles, you know, cause, cause they're wrestling, right. they're wrestling with these issues. They're like, well, we want to, we want to honor God and we don't want to, we, we don't want to do anything that offends him. And, and so they were wrong in, in, you know, where they took that, like the sectarian community, uh, right. you know, uh, that followed the book of Jubilees, right. The, which, uh, prohibited Jews and Gentiles eating together. Um, right. but yeah, there was because of that association with idolatry and, and so uh, the apostles are correcting a lot of a lot of that, um, but but you also you know you also can kind of understand a little bit better uh, how complex right. how complex this situation really was. Um, that you're you're it's not just like this over it's not just that Jews were bigoted you know <laughs> it's like right so, somewhere but like uh, Jews in the in the first century I mean they you know they wanted to honor God and, and they're wrestling with these issues. The apostles are coming in, they're wrestling with these issues. How, you know, what, what do we do with this? Peter had to be corrected on, on this issue and, and be given uh, the correct perspective by, by the Lord. Um, and, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, the, just, just understanding the, the context there ju just adds a lot of uh, nuance to these, these passages. Right. Yeah.
Yeah, well, that's that's great, man. That's exciting. I I can't wait. Are you writing a paper on that? You said. Um, <sighs> yeah, you know, I I actually wrote. Uh, uh, a lot in a thesis that never got published. And, and, uh, one of the reasons why was because I was, I was actually, I think I bit off more than I could chew. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm going to, uh, publish just little bits of it or if I'm going to do lectures and, uh, publish the lectures. Um, I'm still, so, so far what I've been doing is I did put together a lecture and I've been traveling and, uh, visiting congregations and kind of presenting some of the, um, trying to refine how I present the material. Um, the, the fact is, is that there's so much information and there's so many receipts. You know, people always say, well, you know, where, how do you know that every, you know, every, every time somebody ate meat, it was, it was, you know, offered to, to one of the gods or, you know, and I'm sure there were times where meat was uh, purchased from the meat market and then was taken home and eaten with a family. Um, right. So I'm not saying every single, but the, if you had meat, it was offered to a God. That's all, that's all there is to it. There's plenty of receipts on that. And the, uh, it's been interesting presenting at congregations because I've, I've, uh, it's been a, a bit of trial and error. I uh, went to one congregation and I, my whole presentation was just receipts, you know, just quote after quote after quote. And I literally was losing people. People were, people were falling asleep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, then, I, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I, no, 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 I no, no, have, no, go, go. Yeah. I have, I have a thought that I wanted to just on that note of um, meat being associated with, with sacrifice and, and even meat that that's purchased at, at the marketplace, how, how that had to have come from, um, you know, a, a pagan altar uh, or offered to a god. I wonder if that's sort of in the background of the Greek term koinos. Um, Interesting. Yeah, because uh, the Greek term koima, it, it means something that is shared, right? Uh, that's also translated as common, right? In, in the, right. And so it, it's shared, you know, with the, the, uh, the deity, uh -huh. uh, the and, and so yeah, and Koinos, yeah, and, and Koinos, uh is, is always talking about a man-made uh, label of unclean. Like we we think of it as unclean, right? But but right. it's really a a, a man-made uh, a man-made label of not acceptable. Yeah, it's a man-made category, and, and yeah, that that's um, it's interesting because that word is uh, you know the the understanding of unclean is due to some unfortunate translations in English. Right. But, but that's, that's the word that Paul uses. And in, in first uh, in Romans right. 14, when he says, uh, I am persuaded right. that nothing is unclean in itself. I'm the, the word there is koinos. And right. basically what he's saying is like this, this category that it was contrived and in, in much later, uh, it, it, you know, it, by tradition, that that is not something that, that actually exists in reality, you know, that that is right. Not yeah. And so, um, and but, but, yeah, but what's, what's interesting about that is that he also associates it with people who, with people, right? Yeah. Yeah. So in, so in other words, I mean, if you, if, if we take your, uh, your thought to the next step, you have food that is, that is shared with the deity, but then the people who are not considered to be covenant members with, uh, you know, because they haven't been circumcised, ritually circumcised, whatever you want to say, they're considered koinos as well because they haven't, they haven't come over yet. But Paul is saying, no, 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 I don't think anything like this is koinos, right? It's all, yeah. it's all acceptable because, because it's all of the Lord. Right? Yeah. And, and what, what is, what does Acts 10 say? You know, do not call what God has cleansed koinos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, man, that, that's exciting, uh, man. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited to see your work in this area. I, I think it, it's going to be a huge contribution um, and uh, really appreciate you coming on and, and talking to us about it and talking about uh, the all the other exciting stuff you guys are doing uh, over there uh, at, at Tor Resource. Um, I would just, before we conclude here again, um, would you uh, mind kind of uh, letting people know where they can, uh, again, where they can find your work, where they can find uh, Tor Resource, and and uh, find out what more about what you guys are doing. Yeah, so uh, once again, torresource.com is kind of the the main website. You can get to anything and everything that Tor Resource does through that. Um, the the learning center is on a separate site, but once again, you can get to it from torresource.com. The learning center is trlearningcenter.com. Uh, um, my personal work, I do have a blog site that I that I uh, run, um, pronomian.com, uh, but. 
a lot of my work has, you know, a, a, now with uh, Tor Resource being where it's at, a lot of my work is kind of on both platforms. I'm starting to share share the work on both platforms. Um, and I think that I'll probably be doing more and more of that. But pronomian.com is where you can find a lot of my, my PDFs and stuff that you wouldn't be able to find. I put together a, a pronomian prayer book uh, that you can find on pronomian.com. Um, I sell my commentaries. I have two commentaries that you can find on pronomian.com. Um, but uh, ultimately, all of that, you know, the commentary, my commentaries will eventually be uh, fully available on Tor Resource as well yeah and, and those are excellent by the way uh you're you wrote thank on, you very much yeah you wrote on the book of acts and uh colossians right colossians and yeah philemon. Col colossians philemon yep right yeah, exactly. so yeah i i have both of those uh guys check check it out go to torresource.com check out pronomian.com uh, i'll leave the links in the description and uh you will be blessed uh it's really great material and uh caleb thank you again so much for joining me man it was um yeah, it, it was a pleasure. And uh, thank you so much for having me on, man. It's 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 uh it, it really is a, a blessing to come on and, and chat with you. And uh, uh, you know, I, I love you so much, and and uh, I'm excited by the work you're doing too. And and uh, yeah, everything that uh, you're putting out, I'm I'm always excited to see what's coming out next. Well, to God be the glory, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's a blessing. So, all right, guys, we'll see you next time. Thank you again for joining, and uh, blessings and shalom.